Buenas noches a todos ustedes. I'm sorry, this is supposed to go in English, right? And you will notice that I have an accent. So if you don't understand a phrase or a word that I say, please ask and I'll repeat it in Spanish so that you can get it. I'm going to be speaking about global trends and considering doing international holistic missions. And I think uh, this is a fascinating topic. Well, we all know that the world is characterized by change, right? Everything's changing. There are certain changes that happen at a slow pace, and others are more dramatic that are impacting our lives. But the main message behind is that we have to be aware of these changes. And the good way of tracking down those is by tracking down trends. Therefore, tonight I'm going to be speaking about things that you as a church leader or as a church member considering doing international holistic missions should be focusing on as global trends. And I'll be focusing on three trends that I consider the most important. First of all, changes in global poverty. The second one is the emergence of the church in the global south. And the third one is the risks associated to go in, to go, uh, to risky places in the world. So let's jump in into the first one. Those are global trend number one, changes in poverty. And you know what I will be doing is following up the latest millenn uh, Millennium Development Goals report released by the United Nations. If you are asking yourself, what, is the, what are the Millennium Development Goals? Those are goals that were formulated 24 years ago by nations and multinational organizations in order to decrease poverty. So we are just about to come to the point of 25 years that they've been released, and they release a report on that. So the message behind is that there are good news and bad news. So I'll be starting with the good news. First of all, extreme poverty has been reduced more than a half so far. The goal has been to reduce poverty, extreme poverty, people living under $1.25 per day by half by 2015. And this has been accomplished so far. I'm sorry, I'm going back. This is the right one. The, words that the world has started with 47% in 1990, and now we are at 22%. So this goal has been achieved. In, in average for the world as a total. But you can see over there in the graph that there are huge disparities between regions. The two most important are Sub-Saharan Africa, and the second one is South Asia. And when I say in South Asia, it's basically India. The second is about people living in hunger. And basically, Larry took my presentation when he did this contest of who wants to be a missionary. You can see the reduction in people living in chronic hunger from 1,000 million, 1 billion, in the period of 1990, 1992, to 868 million in the period between 2010, 2012. This is a reduction from 22.3% to almost 15%. It seems that the goal of reaching the Millennium Development Goal by 2015 is something that it's possible. The composition of this problem, though, in the world, it's interesting to see how it changed. And you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa plus Southern Asia are the most predominant regions where chronic hunger is still present in the world. And if you can consider Southern Asia and basically India, the amount of people over there that are suffering from hunger surpasses all the amount of people that you can put together in Sub-Saharan Africa. The next one uh, is related to that, and that's the proportion of children under the uh, age of five who are moderately or severely underweight. This is chronic malnutrition, child and chronic malnutrition. Still, you can see the skew uh, about South Saharan Africa and Southern Asia. And you can see over there in the right, the trend and the line in green and the point in green is the Millennium Development Goal. It seems that it's going to be reached, but there's a significant effort that needs to be going into that 
in order to make it happen. There are other changes in poverty. One of them is access to water. In the past 20 years or 22 years, uh, there's an estimate that 2 billion people got access to reliable sources of water. And if we can consider that the world's population is two, 7 billion, 2 billion accessing reliable sources of water is an important and significant accomplishment. The other thing that's been accomplished is that the conditions of people living in slums in cities, in big cities, have improved in the past decade. But at the same time, there's more people that are migrating to the cities, to the urban areas. So the problem of urbanization of the world, it's, it's, it's already a global trend. And it's posing significant challenges. Now let's go to the, the, to the news that are not so good. The challenges. One of them is child mortality. And you can see in this graph that the world in 1990 was at 67 uh, child's dead uh, per thousand live births, and it decreased to 52. And uh, you know, it's very, very difficult that this two-thirds uh, reduction from 1990s numbers are going to be achieved by 2015. Uh, child deaths are basically located in the most uh, challenged poverty locations in the world. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southern Asia, playing a significant role in the, into that. And it's basically located in the first month of life of these children. Another challenge is maternal mortality. And you can see the numbers here. The goal was to reduce by three-fourths 1990s numbers. And you can see that we are far way out there to meet that goal. You can see the numbers over here in the, in the bottom part. And on the other side, you see the African continent and the sub-Saharan region. And if your geography is OK, you can put names to these areas and see where the problem is more predominant. Teenage pregnancy is a significant factor for maternal mortality. And you know, if you're thinking that teenage pregnancy is an issue here in the United States, is 136% more of a problem in developing countries. Another one, education. The goal has been that by 2015, the world could achieve primary, primary universal education. There has been a significant progress. The world, in average, is an, at a 90%, 90% enrollment for primary education. But it's, near, it's low down. The progress is low down. And it seems that this goal is not going to be reached by 2015. Sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see, is in the 77% enrollment. And this graph is very important because it provides information on um, what are the main factors that are determining the fact that people cannot access to primary education. And you know, where you live, whether you are a boy or a girl, and whether you are poor or not so poor, are very import important factors. Being a girl, being poor, and living in rural areas is the worst condition to access primary education. So if you're thinking about the least of them, as the Bible says, and the Lord told us in the gospel, you can put an image into that. It's being a girl in a poor area, living in rural conditions. Another challenge is the significant threat posed by environmental sustainability. There has been a tremendous increase of CO2 emissions since 1990, an increase of 41%. There are reductions of forest areas, even though many countries went and uh, they decided to protect many, many areas despite of their efforts 
forest areas are still being reduced in the world. There's an overexploitation on marine fish stocks, and there are diminishing yields, and there's a faster rate of species extinction. This is posing a challenge to our biblical mandate of a steward, a steward in creation. And this is going to uh, be something that will impact us in the next decades. Another interesting uh, thing to mention is that the countries, the developed countries in general, decrease foreign aid. Starting in 2008 with the economic crisis, but there's a disproportionate distortion of foreign aid going to least developed countries. And that's the line at the bottom in red or orange, as you can see in that image. Something I'd like to mention is something very interesting. There was a survey here in the United States, and people were asked, how much do you think the government is putting out of the federal budget into foreign aid? And most of the people answered that it's 25%. Then they were asked, how much do you think is fair to contribute from the federal budget? And people said, 10% will be good. Guess what's the reality? 0.5% of federal budget goes to foreign aid. Okay? So if the United States wants to save in order to solve the problem of internal debt, they shouldn't put it on the backs of the poor in the world. So the conclusion on global poverty is that it's basically located in the sub-Saharan Africa region, South Asia. Those are the poorest regions in the world that are facing the most significant challenges. Churches and charities should consider the status of global poverty when considering international holistic missions, especially if you want to reach the most vulnerable in the world. And the biggest needs are present where Christianity is expanding. And this is leading me to the next topic or the next global trend that I want to talk to you, the emergence of the church in the global south. More Christians are present, professing Christians are present in the global south, and I'll develop the other points over there in the slide, in the next slide. This is a graph taken by the Pew Research Center Forum on Religion and Public Life on numbers based in, in 2010. It's a comparison of 100 years of population of Christians in the world. And as you can see, 61% of Christians from all denominations, all traditions, now, or by 2010, four years ago, live in the global south. Seven out of the 10 most uh, or largest countries with Christian population in the world are in the global south. Only three are in the global north. And what about Protestants? Uh, Protestants are basically the same, it's even worse, or even better. 67% of the population that declares th themselves as Protestants, they live in the global south. And you can see the proportions over there. 37% living in sub-Saharan Africa. Remember that we said that this is the area where the challenge of poverty is the most. 17% in Asia Pacific, and 13% in Latin America and the Caribbean. The Church of the Global South has become a theological reference in many cases. And I would like to refer to one case. That's the case of the Anglican Church. I attend, the, I, I, I attend an Anglican Church. And when the Episcopal Church in Canada and the United States decided to take a liberal approach, there were so many congregations that looked for refuge in the Global South. And by that time, I was living in Bolivia, and we had seven congregations in our diocese in Bolivia that were located in the United States. And the church in the global south stood up in order to defend traditional biblical belief that the uniqueness of Christ and his substitutionary death for us, the authority of the scriptures, the confidence that the gospel has the power to save and to transform the church, the call to repent from otherwise behavior. And the church in the global south helped and supported churches in the United States and Canada, and in the United States specifically, in order to form a new diocese, the Anglican Church of North America. Interesting. 
Christians in the global south at the same time are living in less concentrated environments of Christians compared to Christians living in the global south, in the global north. In the global north, one Christian lives among 69% of other Christians or declare themselves as Christians. In the global south, is 24%. So they face other challenges. And as the GAFCON communique from the Anglican Church in 2013 says, that whomever is trying or willing to witness Christ, witness to Christ in the global south, they should be considering suffering for Christ. Interesting. The challenges to the church in the global south are basically the similar ones that we are facing in the global north. Aggressive secularism, different expressions of secularism, uh, Os Guinness speaks about this. Um, militant extremist threats that are threatening the physical existence of the church in the global south and seductive syncretism, the mixture between pagan beliefs into the gospel. Those are the most significant challenges mentioned in the GAFCON communique. What can we say about the emergence of the church in the global south? that the idea of a missionary field in the South is being redefined. Interesting. More and more population, Christian population, are going to be living in the global South. Holistic missions should be considered in the context of partnership. So if you're sending a team to go and do something missionary abroad and you're not contacting the local church, there's something strange over there. The Global South Church and the Global North Church should partner in order to learn from each other, nourish each other, strengthen each other, and build up Christianity. Mutual transformation and discipleship through missions is an important objective for churches from both ends, Global South and Global North. And the consolidation of Christianity in the South has global importance. Let me refer to the third global trend, and that's security when ministering in high-risk places. High-risk places are places that have an ethnic or have a political or religious conflict that is going on. And if you throw over there into that formula, a disaster, a natural disaster, is even more conflicting. It's interesting to mention that the number of conflicts in Africa have increased in 2012, they have been the highest number since 1945. It seems that the world is becoming more conflictive rather than the opposite. This is posing different, different and difficult challenges. And on that graph, for example, in this one, you see the number of internal displaced people in countries due to conflict. 28.8 million people displaced because of conflict and the trend is growing. On the other side, you see the people displaced or mobilized because of a natural disaster. Well, let me tell you that the world's not the same, and especially since uh, the post-9-11. Uh, One of the things that happened is after 9-11, as a response of the West to the terrorist attack, the terrible terrorist attacks to the West and to New York, there was one thing that was mentioned by, in that time, Secretary Colin Powell. He mentioned that his role was making sure that he had the best relationship with NGOs who he considers such a force multiplier for us and such an important part of our combat team. In other words, he was equating being Western charity organizations to part of the military deployment against terrorists in the world. And let me tell you that the terrorists were listening when this statement came through and um, came out. Therefore, terrorist organizations are considering every organization that is Western as the enemy. You are part of the establishment to fight against them. Therefore, you become the enemy, whether you're Christian or not. And Christian organizations are facing a more challenge, more significant challenge. Therefore, the risk of being abducted or killed when you're going to high-risk areas 
has increased significantly. And this has repercussions on the operations of the organizations that are sending missions outside. First of all, if somebody gets kidnapped, how do you get guidance in terms of negotiating with the kidnappers if they are asking for ransom? And if something like this happens, the potential liabilities of the duty of care that needs to be provided by the sending organization becomes huge. A lawsuit by the victims or the families could put churches and ministries completely out of business. Those are things that you need to consider when considering doing international holistic missions. Therefore, in order for us to have effective international holistic missions, we should be considering three global trends that I consider the most important. Changes in global poverty, the emergence of the church in the global south, and the security in high-risk areas. Thank you very much.